knowledge is when we explain the unknown in terms of the known, when we succeed in fitting a new experience into a system of concepts and ideas. And I would call understanding the direct and unmediated contact with reality as it is experienced moment by moment. Knowledge is a knowledge essentially of the old. It is uh, the old, in this sense, is this set of notions and ideas which we fabricate out of our direct experience. It is like a series of finished articles manufactured from our perceptions and our emotions, uh, our feelings of all kinds, uh, and uh, embodied in the traditional form of language and of uh, accepted ideas. Uh, knowledge, uh, understanding, on the other hand, is essentially a contact with the new as it perpetually presents itself. Uh, knowledge is knowledge of the finished article, and understanding is understanding of the raw material. There, uh, we see, of course, from this uh, definition, uh, that knowledge can always be communicated, but understanding cannot be communicated. Understanding is direct experience, and as we know, in every field, no direct experience is communicable. Uh, no one can have a direct feeling of somebody else's pain, or somebody else's love or hunger. And in the same way, nobody can have anybody else's direct experience, direct contact with an event or a situation. There can, of course, be knowledge about understanding, uh, and such knowledge is naturally useful in as much as it proves to us that certain understandings have taken place in the past, and that understanding is at all times possible. But this knowledge of understanding, like any other form of knowledge, is not understanding itself. The finished article is not the finished, uh, is not the raw material. And as I say, we cannot pass on understanding, though we can pass on knowledge by means of words or other symbols. Now, every adult possesses large stocks of knowledge. Some of this knowledge is correct, some of it is incorrect, uh, some of it merely looks like knowledge and is neither correct nor incorrect, but actually meaningless. It is pseudo-knowledge. Such pseudo-knowledge is knowledge which cannot be verified. Uh, this has been discussed by modern technical philosophy, by the logical positivists, who have made it very clear that meaning can be attributed to any proposition only in so far as it can be verified in actual experience. The fact that you can have images about a concept is no proof that it is a, a valid or true concept. Uh, for example, why we have no images of uh, the nature of the electromagnetic field or the gravitational field. Nevertheless, uh, statements made about these fields have a complete meaning because uh, they, one can deduce from these statements other statements which are perceptually verifiable. And metaphysical statements are statements which, according to the logical positivists, 
are without meaning. They are expressive in the same way as lyrical poetry is expressive. But they are not meaningful. And uh, one of the great uh, difficulties which has uh, afflicted mankind from the beginning is, first of all, his tendency to assume that pseudo-knowledge is real knowledge, and his, or secondly, his tendency uh, to imagine that knowledge is the same as understanding. These two things are very closely related. And they are both very serious, uh, what they may, one may call them, sins of the intellect. They result in uh, most grave aberrations. For example, most of the appalling atrocities committed in the name of religion, of organized religion, and we must remember that organized religion has committed endless atrocities, these atrocities are essentially due to the confusion between knowledge and understanding and between knowledge and pseudo-knowledge. There has been an immense overvaluation of words in religion uh, because words have been taken for things. They have been taken, the finished product has been taken as the equivalent of the raw material, the direct experience, the statements about God have been taken, uh, mistaken as uh, the actual experience of God. Consequently, we see uh, in many religions the setting up of dogmas, uh, the, which is essentially an idolatrous worship of words, the insistence upon uniformity of belief, the insistence upon assent by all and sundry to a certain uh, concepts, uh, and uh, persecution when there is political power in the hands of the dogmatizers, if people refuse to uh, indulge in this form of word worship. Uh, and this is a very, very grave matter, this, uh, this business of confusing knowledge with understanding. Uh, it is not a two-way matter. Those who have understanding, the men and rare men and women, I think, who have understanding in all situations, are always sufficiently intelligent not to mistake their understanding for knowledge. They see quite well that a system of conceptual knowledge is just as necessary to the conduct of life as a spontaneous insight into reality as it arises moment by moment. But the contrary-wise mistake, the mistake of imagining that knowledge is understanding, is terribly common and is, uh, as I say, responsible for many of our miseries. And it's interesting here, I think, to speculate on the proportion of human misery which is due to our own fault and the proportion which is due to the nature of the world. I would say roughly that perhaps one third of our miseries are of cosmic origin. They are miseries due to the fact that we are embodied and that we inherit genes which are susceptible, which are uh, afflicted by deleterious mutations. Uh, also, and in a, a sense too, our miseries, uh, this part of our miseries, may be called the rent extorted by nature for the privilege of living on the surface of this planet where the soil is largely poor, and the climate is bad, and the inhabitants of the planet include immense numbers of microorganisms causing diseases in man himself and his domestic animals and his cultivated plants. Well, this, as I say, accounts perhaps for a third of the total misfortunes of the human race. The remaining two-thirds, I think, we bring upon ourselves. They are homemade disasters, uh, and a great many of these homemade disasters are due to what may be called sins of the intellect, uh, well, 
spoken of the sin of the intellect, which consists in thinking that uh, knowledge is understanding, and the other sin of the intellect, which consists in thinking that pseudo-knowledge is knowledge. And uh, closely related to these two sins are the almost universal sins of oversimplification, over-abstraction, over-generalization. Worthwhile, perhaps, to give a, an example or two of these things. Uh, let's take the over-generalization. This consists in, of saying, without any evidence, that uh, um, the general form of the statement is uh, all X's are Y, or all A's have a single cause, which is B. When you get in the Middle Ages, for example, the uh, communist uh, overgeneralization was uh, all infidels are damned. Well, from the Muslim point of view, all infidels meant all Christians, and from the Christian point of view, all infidels meant all Muslims. Then there was... Uh, uh, Another very common overgeneralization that all heretics are inspired by the devil and all eccentric old women are witches. And uh, then in the terrible period of the wars of religion in the 16th and 17th century, all these persecutions and battles were motivated by very, very simple overgeneralizations which were all Catholics are the enemies of God, or if you happen to be on the Pope's side, all Lutherans, Calvinists, and Anglicans are the enemies of God. And in our own time, we've seen exactly the same appalling intellectual sins committed by the dictators. I mean, the Nazis made this same sort of overgeneralization. They said that all the ills of humanity have one cause, which is Jews, and all Jews are subhuman enemies of mankind. And similarly, among the communists, we have the same overgeneralization. All the ills of humanity are due to one cause, which is capitalists, and all capitalists and their supporters are subhuman enemies of mankind. Well, on the face of it, obviously such overgeneralizations cannot possibly be true. But the fact remains uh, that the temptation to this kind of uh, intellectual delinquency is fearfully strong, and that most of us find it extremely difficult to resist it when uh, the temptation is presented. We can resist such things as the Hitlerian overgeneralization, but notice in conversation how easy it is for one to fall into the, uh, the sort of all X's are Y type of statement, how universal this is. Every demagogue and every crusader has always made use of these um, products of intellectual delinquency. And uh, this, as I say, is a, is a very important uh, point when we consider the problem of knowledge and its relation to understanding. Well, and now let us go rather further into this whole question of knowledge, leaving our understanding to, to a discussion for a later part of this lecture. Uh, Knowledge, that there are very many circumstances in human life in which understanding is not essential. Understanding, as I say, is essential in coping with the uh, personal relationships towards ourselves, towards other people, towards uh, events as they arise moment by moment in life. But there are many circumstances in human life where conceptual knowledge, organized and accumulated and handed on from generation to generation, is uh, the only useful thing which uh, uh, we can have. For example, uh, suppose I wish to manufacture sulfuric acid or to keep accounts for a banker. Uh, 
I go to a school where these uh, subjects are taught, or I buy a book in which uh, the accumulated experience in relation to these subjects has been set forth. Uh, I do not have to have, in these particular circumstances, a moment-to-moment -moment understanding of what arises. All that is necessary for me, as a professional man, is uh, that I should acquire the maximum amount of correct knowledge in these fields. And, as I said before, Knowledge is communicable, can be handed down, can be enshrined in words and other forms of symbol, and bequeathed from one generation to another, and is a growing stock of um, a treasure of information. And quite clearly, any form of education must contain as an essential element uh, the handing on of uh, the maximum amount of correct information. And this is especially true, of course, in an industrial civilization like our own, where the success of any given society depends entirely on its ability to continue technological development and to uh, understand what is going on in this highly complicated world we live in. Now, I think it's worth uh, developing this for a little bit. Uh, there, as you've probably seen in your newspapers and the magazines, there is now a growing concern in this country precisely because of the, this problem of knowledge. There is a crisis of knowledge going on that uh, during a period when every other nation has made enormous efforts to impart more knowledge, more correct knowledge, to more young people, the many professional educators in this country, educationists, have followed the opposite course. And they have followed it I, through a mistaken interpretation, I would say, of Dewey's um, conception of uh, of learning through doing and of education as life adjustment and self-realization. Uh, they've applied these principles of Dewey in such a way that in many schools there is now a great deal of doing without any learning. And also they have uh, taught adjustment to practically everything except the central 20th century fact that, uh, that unless we have a great deal of correct knowledge, the society in which we live is bound to decline and uh, finally go to destruction because we cannot persist in this uh, type of uh, industrial civilization without uh, an immense amount of correct knowledge. And I must say the, the figures... Uh, which are quoted, are very alarming. I mean, fact, for example, that 50 years ago, more than 50% of all high school students uh, studied algebra, and now less than 25% study it. 50 years ago, something like 30% studied geometry, now only 11%. Nearly 20% studied physics, now only 4% that more than half the schools in the country give no courses in either physics or chemistry. These are very alarming facts. And quite clearly, the, the situation is becoming sufficiently terrifying to force a change in this, uh, this whole policy. There is a, it's quite clear that we're going to get a form of education which will put more stress than has been put during the last 20 or 30 years on uh, the imparting of correct knowledge, which we cannot do without. But, of course, education is more than the imparting of correct knowledge. This is an essential element in any rational education at the present time, or at any time, 
But uh, there is also this other element, the element which uh, Dewey calls life adjustment and self-realization. This has always been uh, regarded as one of the ends of education, the most important end after the imparting of correct knowledge. Well, the problem is how do we promote life adjustment and self-realization? There have been many answers to this question. Most of them belong to one or other of two main educational families, the classical and the progressive. The progressive uh, is inclined to concentrate on the immediate problems of the present. It answers the questions by providing courses in such strange, to me, strange subjects as consumer economics and job information and even consumer mathematics, whatever that may be. And um, uh, with more sensible things like courses in family relationships and mental health and all the rest of it. But it does uh, tend, uh, as the facts seem to show, to neglect what used to be called the fundamentals and what still remain fundamentals in any uh, highly organized technical society. The uh, classical answer to the problem uh, is, is made in terms of courses in Greek and Latin literature, in the foreign languages, uh, modern languages and literature, in world history, and uh, in philosophy to some extent, above all in Western philosophy, because Eastern philosophy is completely ignored at present. And uh, we may ask why, what, what is the point of classical education? I mean, after all, Virgil and Homer seem a very long way away, even Chaucer and Shakespeare seem a very long way away. So why bother with classical education? Well, the, the answer has been given many times, and uh, it can be summed up, I think, quite easily, that the, the whole concept of the value of a classical education is to produce not so much a disciplined mind, people talk about this thing, the discipline of Latin grammar and so on, which I think is nonsense, but the rather to produce an experienced mind. Uh, Emerson pointed out that uh, this type of education uh, produced a sense of immense longevity. It permits the person who has had it to, to view contemporary uh, events in the light of this immense vicarious experience running back over more than 2,000 years, which is included in a, in a classical education. Well, there's obviously a great deal to be said for this, but we have to remember the fact that the vicarious experience to be obtained from the humanities of 2,000 years ago is in, to a considerable extent, irrelevant to the facts of the 20th century. In many ways, of course, our own society resembles very much the society of antiquity. But in other respects, our world is profoundly different from the antique world. Let us take a few obvious examples. In their world, the rate of change was exceedingly slow. In our world, thanks to advancing technology, the rate of change is extraordinarily fast and keeps society in what may be called a chronic state of revolution. 
Then again, to consider some of the uh, moral problems in in their world, infanticide was taken for granted, and uh, slavery was regarded not only as necessary to the Greek way of life, but also as as rational and proper and right. Uh, we, obviously, uh, cannot, being the heirs of 18th and 19th century humanitarianism, we cannot accept uh, this point of view. We cannot uh, hope to solve our economic and demographic problems in the, this, to us, hideous way which they, in which they were solved in the past. Well, then take another uh, point on which there are profound differences between ourselves and the people of antiquity. Uh, it's interesting in as much as uh, this point was commented on by Cicero, who said that uh, people who did not know what had gone on in the world before them were doomed to remain perpetual children. Well, curiously enough, the men of his time and of his uh, and his predecessors did not know what had gone on before. Actually, it's only in the last five generations that anything like a complete history of mankind has come into existence. It's incredible. I mean, even a hundred years ago, how little the historians, even the greatest historians of the period, knew how small the materials at their disposal were. Actually, it is only within the last five generations that, uh, that this immense historical knowledge has opened up before us. Uh, we know now uh, about man's past, going back for half a million years at least, and we know about the activities of human societies in every continent. And this was absolutely impossible to be put antiquity. You get, for example, the greatest um, historian of antiquity, Thucydides, saying in the preface to his history of the Peloponnesian War that nothing of any great importance had happened before his own time, which seemed to rather astounding statement in the light of what we know now. So that here again, the experience of the, uh, the vicarious experience derived from the study of the old humanities is not entirely adequate to the, uh, our present needs. So what we need, I think, in the matter of education is a kind of combination between the classical and the progressive uh, point of view, uh, what we need is a teaching of the humanities of the past, of the humanities of the present, and maybe of the humanities of the foreseeable future. Uh, we have to combine a knowledge of the local cultural tradition with uh, a teaching partly vocational and partly psychological, of adaptation to present social needs and to the probable needs of the immediate future. Uh, for this purpose, we shall need a modified form of the classical curriculum, and I think a modified form of the, of the um, uh, progressive curriculum, because we need something a bit more realistic than uh, consumer economics and job information uh, in this vertiginously uh, changing world of ours. This is not enough. And then, to a combination of the classical and the progressive, then we shall have to add, of course, the, uh, the inculcation of correct information, in other words, uh, scientific and technical training, well, this uh, education, this ideal education, which is far from existing at present, but which is not at all beyond the bounds of possibility, uh, we have to ask of this, uh, we have to ask in relation to this, will this promote the self-realization 
of which John Dewey spoke in our vocabulary, will it help us towards understanding? Now, however excellent such an education may be, I don't think it will help us towards understanding, because what such an education will do is to adapt us essentially to the old. It will adapt us to the, the traditions embodied in words and ideas which have come down to us in the past. It will give us experience, it will make our minds experienced. But the paradox of our existence is precisely this, that we need experience in order to do the practical affairs of life. But in regard to what may be called understanding, in regard to immediate insights, immediate contact with reality moment by moment, Experience is very often a handicap. We have to circumvent it, to get rid of it. There's a saying in the Tao Te King, Lao Tzu, where he says, knowledge is adding to your stock day by day. The practice of the Tao is subtracting. This doesn't mean, of course, that we can live by subtraction alone. We have to go on adding. Otherwise, we should not be able to exist in this highly complicated world. But it does mean that there are many circumstances in life where addition is not only not enough, but is actually an obstacle, and where we somehow have to subtract, strip ourselves, in order to get this immediate uh, understanding through direct contact with reality, moment by moment. And this, of course, is the, as I will come back to this question of the paradox, the, our whole existence is a paradox. There's, this is the fundamental paradox. That these conditionings, this learning of language, this accumulation of experience, is precisely the thing that makes us human. There is a kind of metaphysical slogan used by the existentialist philosophers now, which says, existence is prior to essence. Well, this happens to be one of the few metaphysical statements which can be verified. It is verified by the uh, knowledge we have of the so-called wolf children, the children who have been adapt adopted by animals and uh, have been brought up in animal surroundings and have survived and have then been brought back into human societies. Where these children have the form of human beings but are not human. So it becomes quite clear that the, the essence of humanity is not inherited. We, we are not born with it. We come into it. We, we make ourselves human. We grow into humanity. And we grow into humanity, partly by imitating our elders, partly by acquiring speech with the enormous potentialities of conceptual knowledge which speech gives us, partly by building up uh, fixed behavior patterns and patterns of words and ideas. These are the things which make us human. We would not be human if it were not for this education. But, paradoxically, these are the things precisely which make understanding difficult or impossible. We have to be... The paradox is this, that these, this type of conditioning is required in order to produce a form of developed consciousness. But... In order to use this developed consciousness in its uh, highest uh, capacity, which is in the capacity of understanding, we have to subtract everything that was added. All our life is a paradox, of course. This is just merely one of the 
of the numerous uh, things that we find so puzzling in our lives. Uh, we can put it in another way. We can say that uh, language, which is, of course, the medium in terms of which uh, education is carried on, language is necessary and essential, but in many circumstances of life it is absolutely fatal. And uh, we find this again in uh, the questions of the direct uh, experience of reality. If we are tied up, uh, if we allow ourselves to be dominated by linguistic formulae and uh, recollections of, uh, of word patterns, we shall not have a fresh and uh, novel response to a fresh and novel situation. We shall respond to the new with the old. And this, uh, the old, is always, in some measure, irrelevant to the new. So, uh, however good uh, our education may be, our education in uh, a knowledge of the tradition, the cultural tradition, and in adaptation to the immediate facts of the present and the foreseeable future. However good such an education is, it is always an education in terms of concepts, in terms of the organized old experience, and it is never in the nature of things an education in understanding, in an education in responding in a new way to new circumstances. Well, now we have to consider what, how do we get understanding? How can we make it possible for ourselves to have understanding? Well, the first thing to be um, realized is that um, we can't force uh, ourselves to have understanding. We can't will understanding. We can't laboriously get it. We simply have to create the circumstances in which, so to speak, understanding will come to us of its own accord. The mind Again, this is another strange paradox as we discover. Our minds are, to a great extent, external to our personal selves. We see this, of course, again and again. We are aware of, um, for example, take this business of just moving a hand. How do I move a hand? I don't move it. I give a command or I think of it and some, somebody else does the moving. Or else um, how do I when I cut myself how do I heal the wound? Again, I don't do it. Uh, we find as when we look at ourselves closely that there is an immense area in regard to our personal selves, an immense area of ignorance and ignorance. We don't know and we are unable to, to do innumerable things which in our habitual bumptiousness we think that we do know and we do do. But the moment we examine, look into this thing carefully, we find that we don't know and that we do not do these things ourselves. After all, the, the fundamental fact of our existence, the fact that there is a relation between mind and body, we know nothing about. We know that there is such a relation. But when it comes to the question, how does an electrochemical event in the brain transform itself into the perception of, say, a quartet by Haydn, or a thought about Socrates, we haven't the faintest idea. This is just a fact which we have to accept, and we don't know. 
And it's the same with, uh, with practical things, with what we can do or not do. There is, a, you may remember, a well-known little piece of rhetoric by Henley, which ends up, uh, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Well, actually nothing could be further than the truth. We are not masters of our fate. Nobody is the master of his fate. The most that we can do is to cooperate with our fate and thereby, to some extent, direct it. And we are not the captains of our soul. We are merely the noisiest passenger. <laughs> We're a passenger so unimportant we don't even sit at the captain's table. We don't know, even by report, what the soul ship looks like or or how it works, or where it is going. We just accept these extraordinary facts. And here, I think, is the secret of the, uh, of the, um, what may be called the method of coming to contemplation. That the, the method is essentially a method of total awareness. This is, of course, it's a very ancient doctrine. The, the doctrine of know thyself is at least as old as civilization, perhaps much older, I don't know. And the, when you examine the doctrine of know thyself, it isn't merely a question of indulging in introspection. To know yourself, you have to know your environment, too, to have direct awareness of it. Because after all, our own body is part of the environment, it's a natural object, among other natural objects. And our mind consists, to a very large extent, of reactions to the environment, both animate and inanimate and personal. So that the command, know thyself, is in fact a command for total awareness. And the beginning of total awareness is an awareness of what I've been talking about, this, uh, this ignorance and impotence in which we live. This fact that the catalogue of what we don't know and cannot achieve can be uh, lengthened almost indefinitely. Even such a thing as thought probably doesn't really belong to me. Uh, if you remember Descartes, uh, held it up as the primary certainty, the phrase, I think, therefore I am. But if you look at this carefully, this is the most dubious proposition. Because is it I who actually think? But here, language throws an interesting light. And language, after all, is a sort of collection of fossil observation and latent philosophy. And when we think particularly well, we find ourselves using phrases like a good idea occurred to me, or it came into my head, or I see it now. All these phrases, well, what do they imply? They imply that thoughts arise outside the sphere of the subjective ego and are found by it. Uh, but then probably it would be, instead of saying I see, therefore I am, it would be probably much truer to say thoughts come into existence, and I sometimes find them. So that, uh, as I say, this, this list of our impotencies and ignorances uh, can be lengthened almost indefinitely. Well, there are many people find this at first a, a humiliating and even depressing thought. But actually, I think it's a, a source of peace and a reason for cheerfulness and serenity. Because, after all, I am, I can do very little and I can know very little. And yet, here I am. I may be discontented or unhappy, miserable, but I'm alive and kicking. I, I survive, I get by, I even get on sometimes. And <laughs> if we take these two classes of facts, the fact 
of my ignorance and impotence and the fact of my survival, what can we infer from them? Well, we can infer something which is extremely consoling. We can infer that we are associated with a not-I, which must be extraordinarily knowledgeable and intelligent and strong in order to prevent us from completely wrecking everything. Because in spite of all our efforts at uh, egotistic sabotage, we do think on the whole fairly relevantly, and our physical functioning is on the whole not too abnormal. So that if we choose to cooperate with this uh, greater power and greater knowledge with which we are associated, then everything is all right, uh, even even if the worst happens, it's somehow all right. Whereas if we don't cooperate, even in the best of circumstances, we're all wrong. So, uh, And this is, I think, the, the first uh, important uh, thing we gain from total awareness. Well, then there's another very important thing which happens when we start being totally aware, which is in connection with memory. There are obviously two forms of memory, one which is entirely beneficent and the other which is mainly harmful. Uh, the factual memory, the memory of how to make sulfuric acid or to multiplication table is wholly for the good. But emotionally charged memories are, as all psychiatrists know, a cause of neurosis and psychosis. Even at the best, they're a cause of endless distractions. Uh, Wordsworth has this phrase, remember the uh, and I would wish my day, the child is father of the man, and I would wish my days to be bound each to each in natural piety. But what is natural piety? Natural piety is essentially indulging in memories of vanished loves and, and past happiness. Well, this is, we have no right to spend our time in this. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, and also the good thereof. We have no right to spend the present instant uh, either in wallowing in the thoughts of past happiness, or in bemoaning past misfortunes, or having remorse over old offenses. Similarly, we have no right to spend the present moment in anticipating uh, hypothetical pleasures in the future or uh, apprehending possible disasters to come. And when we have this uh, total awareness, we shall find a very interesting thing. If we are totally aware of our distractions, which are mostly emotionally charged memories or fantasies based upon emotionally charged memories, we shall find that while we have the awareness, this mental whirligig uh, comes to a stop and the memory is empty. This phrase, the emptying of the memory, is, a, is an interesting one. It's used by St. John of the Cross. who makes the, the first startling statement that uh, the emptying of the memory is a good second only to union with God and is, of course, a necessary condition to union with God. Well, uh, we cannot empty the memory by an act of will and we cannot empty it by concentration, even by concentration on the idea of emptiness. It can be emptied, I think, only by total awareness, by becoming aware of these uh, endless temptations to get out of the present moment, which stop the, the whirligig. And not only 
does total awareness uh, result in emptying the memory, at first only for a moment or two at a time, but I think perhaps later on more completely and more permanently. It also seems to have a certain effect on the, uh, what may be called the, the moral tone of the organism. Uh, if I become totally aware of my envy and resentment and uncharitableness, I shall find during the time of that awareness that these feelings are replaced by a, a new and more realistic response to the circumstances surrounding me. There is a, a here again Something happens which could not happen as a result of an act of will or as a result of concentration. This uh, openness of total awareness produces as a byproduct, so to speak, the state which uh, we desire. This complete openness to reality making possible the coming of understanding. When we go forward into this um, uh, deepening total awareness, we shall find another very important thing. This, I think, has been known by many uh, mystics in the past. It's something which you get hints of, certainly in the Buddhist mysticism and certainly in uh, Christian mysticism too. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's a fact which seems to have been rediscovered now by certain modern psychiatrists. Well, the fact that total awareness produces a change in general behavior and a change in the whole apprehension of the nature of the world. I was very struck the other day in reading this uh, passage from uh, Professor Carl Rogers, the psychiatrist, who was speaking about this as a new discovery. I mean, actually, it's immensely old, but it's, thank heaven it's being rediscovered, where he says that in, he says in this passage that uh, when, if we can add to the ordinary visceral and perceptual awareness common to all animals the free and wide awareness of which only human beings are capable. Then, he says, we have an organism which, of which we need not be afraid. He says we have to be very afraid of the human being's behavior. When he excludes from his awareness any considerable area of his experience. Most of the time we exclude from awareness a large area of our experience. We uh, allow ourselves to be conditioned by these uh, uh, verbal uh, hypnotic suggestions and we shut out large areas of our awareness. But, says Professor Rogers, when we open ourselves up to complete awareness, then we find ourselves as aware of what he calls the culture as of the personal needs for food or sex. We are just as aware of uh, a desire for friendliness as of a desire for self-aggrandizement. And we are just aware of a sensitive tenderness towards others as we are aware of our hostilities towards others. And when this happens, he says, then we have no further need of being afraid of man. But man ceases to be this diabolic creature that he very often acts as. And he becomes something, a, a creature we can trust. Now, this is a very interesting thing because if this goes back to the whole conception of Taoism, the intrinsic goodness of human nature provided that we let it uh, 
express itself in its totality without uh, canalizing it and conditioning it by all kinds of nonsense which we have always done. And uh, it seems to me of the greatest interest that, uh, that this immemorial wisdom of the mystics is uh, coming back at anyhow in, in some, in one section at least of the modern psychological theory and practice. And it's, it's a very encouraging fact, I find. And this, as I say, is certainly one of the product, product, products of um, total awareness, this, this awareness of our good sides as well as our evil sides, this awareness of the, of the tenderness towards other people. And even more extraordinary than this, I think, is an awareness not only of the tenderness in ourselves, but of what may be called the tenderness in the universe. The strange fact that we become aware that the universe is in some way fundamentally all right, in spite of everything, in spite of death, in spite of suffering, that this is all right. We become aware with the, as a result of this process of making ourselves totally aware that in spite, even in the worst circumstances, this universe will not let us down completely. And there's an extraordinary phrase, uh, which you imagine, of course, remember, even though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. This is the statement of somebody who's had total awareness and consequent understanding. And Another similar statement, of course, is the infinitely hackneyed statement, God is love. Well, from the point of view of common sense, the first statement really seems the raving of a lunatic. Though he should slay me, yet will I trust in him. And the other statement, statement that God is love seems to fly in the face of all experience and to be obviously untrue. But of course we must remember that common sense is not a product of total awareness. Common sense is a product of a very limited awareness. Of a, it's a product of partly of self-interest, partly of the local traditions, partly of language, partly of passion partly of um, prudence, and the, uh, it is very, very far from being uh, this uh, attitude towards life produced by understanding, which in its turn is made possible by this total awareness. So that what a total awareness gives us then is First of all, this knowledge of our impotence and our ignorance, with its corollary that we must and certainly are directed by something which is simultaneously imminent and transcendent, which keeps us going and prevents us going completely mad. And uh, furthermore, the, another result of Total awareness is the emptying of the memory in the world of St. John of the Cross uh, with consequent ability to live here and now and to be aware of reality moment by moment as it arises. And finally, we become aware, first of all, that we are not as bad as we thought we were. And secondly, that the universe, in spite of everything, is all right that there is this, um, the, this goodness, this all rightness in the world. And in this state of understanding, these strange phrases used by the mystics 
take on meaning. So the logical positivists, of course, say that any metaphysical statement is meaningless, and of course, from the standpoint of common sense or science, they are perfectly meaningless. But the moment there is understanding based on total awareness, then these statements do have meaning. And such statements, for example, all in one or and one in all, uh, samsara and nirvana are the same, or multiplicity is unity, and unity is not so much one as not two. Uh, uh, then the statement such as all things are void, and yet all things are the Dharma body of the Buddha, and so on. All these statements uh, on the ordinary level of consciousness are without any meaning at all. But the moment there has been a preparation of total consciousness and an understanding of the nature of the world, then they take on, they, they are seen to be true, at least as true as verbal statements of ineffable experience can be. And the final result, I think, is, in Buddhist terminology, a fusion of the end with the means, the end being wisdom, Vajna Paramita, the uh, realization uh, of such is and the means being compassion, uh, which is, or love, which is um, wisdom in action. Uh, this, I think, is the, the final result of, of understanding, and uh, to my mind, the, the ultimate uh, goal and final end of human life. Of course, this word love is perhaps the most worn and smudged and dogs-eared word in the whole of our vocabulary. It's worse even than that. It's been, thanks to it having been bored from millions of pulpits and hundreds of millions of loudspeakers, it has a a really dreadful quality now. It, has, it seems to be a kind of insult to good taste and decent feeling. Uh, almost a kind of obscenity which one hardly dares to pronounce. Uh, and yet, after all, this has to be pronounced because finally, what is there? What well, the last word is love. This is the final statement and uh, is the final result of understanding. And with this last word, I'd better make this my own last word, bring this to close. Let us pray that we may understand reality, both in its height and its breadth, in its intensity, and in its fullness. Let us pray that we may understand it, not only in peace, but in action. Not only as the supreme wisdom, but as universal love. Mr. Huxley, what do you think of the word escape? So often that word is hurled at us um, psychologically, and uh, don't you think that there is some justification for certain types of escape? Well, I mean, escape from push this to the limit. You would say it's a, it's a terrible escape not to be a syphilitic and an alcoholic. <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is something which some people have to go through. But I mean, is this an escape? I would say it's common sense, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I, I, word is used in such stupid ways that I, I don't know what people really mean. I mean, of course one escapes what is obviously malignant there. I mean, so I, I don't know how, 
I mean, it's when people in this airy way talk about escapism, I really don't know what it's all about. Well, I mean to uh, explain that, the, uh, the idea being that some certain, certain psychological factors that you seek to escape, you should face and understand and dissipate rather than evading them. Well, I, yes, I quite agree. I mean, I think one should, uh, in that sense, you want to uh, always be a realist. But I mean, I was talking, I mean, some people use this escapism as though anybody who lived a life which wasn't a life, like a novel by Mickey Spillane, was somehow <laughs> an escapist. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the realist sees the phenomena of Mickey Spillane and says, well, this is absolutely intolerable and I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Uh, but he should be aware that this exists, I quite agree, and should be aware that there are factors in his mind which might make him behave like this. I, mean, I don't think anything can be gained by not uh, being aware. I think this is immensely important. I, mean, I do think realism is the, the essence. We have to be aware of what is given, not only within ourselves, but in the universe at large. And we have to be aware of these extraordinary tricks and um, compensations which we fabricate with our imaginations. And in that sense, one should never escape that. <coughs> but in the other sense, yes. Come in the traditional form of yoga, as we all know, uh, do you think a new conception is in order, um, which might be called the uh, chemical yoga? Um, of course, yoga, different paths are lead us to the union of God, to the attempt to. And this would be uh, utilizing your experience and ideas of mescaline, for example. Well, of course, we actually been used from time immemorial. I mean, they, uh, it's incredible the, uh, if you look at the history of the use of drugs in religion, it's, it's universal and it's been used in different societies. In this period, I mean, many of them, of course, are unfortunately very undesirable drugs. But the effort has been made, and uh, I mean, I think without any question, we are probably now on the verge of developing any number of chemicals which will permit extraordinary changes in consciousness to take place. I mean, some of these may be desirable, some not. But we've reached a point, after all, where chemists now are virtually able to produce any kind of molecule that's desired. Uh, for example, uh, it's going to be, I'm going to go there on the middle of May and meeting with the American Psychiatrist Association in Atlantic City. And one evening is going to be spent on the discussion of drugs such as mescaline, lysergic acid and others in relation to psychiatry and in relation to psychology in general. What was the one, uh, what happened to the Lysergic acid, this, oh. is, uh, this is immensely much stronger than, I mean, the dose is only of some one five thousandth of a gram, instead of four, four tenths of a gram. one doesn't do the schizophrenia? Uh, it, if in large doses it will, yes. And then, if, uh, the, the uh, actually the most, uh, Common symptoms of schizophrenia are neither these uh, uh, blissful nor uh, infernal states, although they may be. But, I mean, apparently, most of the time of these wretched schizophrenics are living in a thing which is neither heaven nor hell, but more like limbo, a kind of ghostly world. Uh, which, and the interesting thing is now that they're finding that uh, certain substances uh, produced within the body due to the breakdown of uh, adrenaline, will produce this sort of limbo experience. Uh, and then, I think it is quite clear that we are just on the verge of the most extraordinary uh, future uh, developments in this field. And as I say, I don't see why some of them might be excellent, although certainly many of them may be very undesirable. You raise here in connection with what the general was asking the relationship between science and religion. <coughs> uh, what, to what extent 
can the methods or can the methods of science ever be applied in religion? I mean, for we collaborate just a little uh, in science at least. We have developed one little limited area in which one can be sure that one is not, or to some extent sure that one is not creating what one is seeing. Now, I was thinking of this in connection with this exercise you were mentioning. I noticed that even when you try to look in your mind, observe what is coming dispassionately without criticizing or judging and without trying to change it, even then, you know, if you look carefully, it seems to me that you are pretty, still creating what you are seeing. I think your perspective is, is, seems very hard to fulfill this requirement of not creating what you are seeing. Yes, it's again, I mean, in introspection, of course, in, uh, any sort of forced introspection is undoubtedly... And of course, who is creating what? I mean, I do think that many of the facts of the mind are just as much given as the facts of external nature. Uh, I mean, I think they are real data. They're, they're given facts. I mean, take this really, uh, come back to this thing we talked about just now, this masculine... I mean, it, these given facts which emerge from, I mean, it's got nothing to do with the, this particular self. I mean, these are just things which surprise uh, anybody that is as much as going to Australia and seeing kangaroos would surprise one. I mean, it's just a, a fauna which happens to live in this particular area of the mind, which are, has nothing to do with our personal interests or even with any human interests. I can see. I mean, there, there, there are mind is naturally odd. And I don't think one does create. I mean, one certainly creates uh, <coughs> one sort of uh, the personal subconscious, uh, which creates, I suppose, the compensations to which it advocates all kinds of nonsense out of the present day. This is a, a more or less personal creation, but I would say that there are a great many areas of the mind which don't seem to me to have anything to do with the, the personal self, but are just as much out there in the mental equivalent of space as uh, trees are out there in the, in the space itself. I mean, uh, well, of course, one of the trouble is that you know something about the mind. So, uh, but, uh, it's exceedingly difficult to. Uh, I mean, we are still at the stage in the innovation of the mind, but the, the early naturalists were uh, in relation to biology. I don't know about that point, but at the point where the board of Bond was collecting specimens and studying them, and we don't really even have the point of cataloging them very well. I mean, there's really no taxonomy of them. And I don't think we're going to have a real biology of the mind, an ecology of the mind. It's quite a long time to come. I mean, I think maybe this, uh, this pharmacological experimentation is going to speed up this process quite a lot. But uh, meanwhile, I do think we're still in, in the very earliest stages of the, the exploration of this PhD. These are pharmacological experiments are somewhat abnormal. Uh, something is imposed upon the normal function of the chemistry of the physical. Yes, but of course, uh, I mean, a great many, uh, after all, in these produce experiences, which is, to some persons are perfectly normal. I mean, take this visionary experience. You know, a question of man like Blake is perfectly normal. I mean, the, and I think a great many more people have these experiences, but it's very particularly in this age. I mean, if you say that I have these experiences, well, they say, well, wait till I'm out here, it's over there. <laughs> Whereas in the past, you could say so, and it would be a highly respected member of society, so you could say so. But actually, I'm quite sure that many more people have either fully developed or slight visionary experiences. And what this thing does is permits uh, uh, people who enter these areas areas of the mind to find it difficult where they're over there. And after all, look at the various methods that have been used in religion. I mean, uh, fasting, for example, and leprosy, 
these produce exactly the same phenomena. The uh, head, the um, Canadian psychologist McGill, has been doing some work on what he calls restricted environment. He puts people, uh, they, they lie in warm baths, so they have practically no cacti or stimuli at all. They are in pitch darkness in the soundproof rooms. Well, in a, in a very short time, they're having full blown visionary experiences. And incidentally, it's very interesting, this is exactly what. Uh, the Tibetans are supposed to do in the caves of the Himalaya, uh, regular yogi training. This is what all the, the uh, Christian hermits in the Tibet were doing, having a restricted environment, and consequently getting tremendous visionary experiences. Well, is this normal or abnormal? I don't know. I mean, this is just one of those things. It is uh, an area of the mind which, when we are busily engaged in our ordinary biological life, you don't care. It opened up. In some people it's opened up spontaneously all the time, or quite all. Other people practically never. And I mean, get others only under certain rather peculiar conditions. But the, uh, from all the descriptions, the place you get to, the mental place, is very much the same. Psychologically, there is a fear. Uh, because psychologically, the world and society want to understand something that they desire and nothing new. Therefore, there is a fear, there's a, there's a blocking, there's a, a misunderstanding between the psychological and the actual. Or would you say that that is selfish? Or would you say that one should express that? and take adventure, life as an adventure, and find out. Well, I don't, I don't quite understand the question. I mean, this question of the fear, obviously, fear is highly undesirable in whatever form, and one somehow has to analyze it and see what it's, uh, what it's about. But the, this business of taking life as an adventure seems to be a very important thing. I mean, I remember well, Dr. Suzuki one time saying, I have to go lightly, lightly, tread lightly. And this is the, I do think it is tremendously important. I think it corresponds to your saying, taking as an adventure. I mean, even very serious things can be done in a light way rather than in a ponderous way. I mean, there's a difference between moving over ice and going down, falling through it. Uh, I think this is a, this light movement which doesn't lead to heavy footprints, so to speak. It's, a, it's very desirable. <coughs> And you're the last one to understand it. And you're the last one to understand it. And you're the last one to understand it. Well, yes, I think, because people don't understand it. I mean, I think a great many people don't understand it theoretically. But I must say, I think it, it's sort of remarkable on the whole that when one is with people and able to talk to them, even though they may have extremely perfect theoretical views about the nature of psychology and society. Most people have a pretty fair understanding of what's what in personal relationships. I mean, if you give them a chance and if they get beyond the ordinary cliches and conventions which they've been brought up with, and I think a great many of them can, without much difficulty, get beyond. I think some people remain absolutely stuck. But um, I would say, I don't know, I've been my experience that uh, given a chance, a great many people do understand much better than they appear to understand. I mean, that uh, they understand much better than they think they understand, so much better than their conventional thought persuades them that they understand. I mean, there again, is where I would say then you don't have. You mustn't take the words too seriously. I mean, their words are wholly non-understanding, but at the same time, they, many people 
How much business there? To discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds, and the truth too rarely perceived. And that is the most important topic on earth, peace. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. I speak of peace because of the new face of war. Total war makes no sense in an age where great powers can maintain large and relatively invulnerable nuclear forces and refuse to surrender without resort to those forces. It makes no sense in an age where a single nuclear weapon contains almost 10 times the explosive force delivered by all the Allied Air Forces in the Second World War. It makes no sense in an age when the deadly poisons produced by a nuclear exchange would be carried by wind and water and soil and seed to the far corners of the globe and to generations yet unborn. Today, the expenditure of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need them is essential to the keeping of peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles, which can only destroy and never create, is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring peace. I speak of peace, therefore, as a necessary rational end of rational men. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. And frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. Some say that it is useless to speak of peace or world law or world disarmament, and that it will be useless until the leaders of the Soviet Union adopt a more enlightened attitude. I hope they do. I believe we can help them do it. But I also believe that we must re-examine our own attitudes as individuals and as a nation. For our attitude is as essential as theirs. And every graduate of this school, every thoughtful citizen who despairs of war and wishes to bring peace should begin by looking inward, by examining his own attitude towards the possibilities of peace, towards the Soviet Union, towards the course of the Cold War, and towards freedom and peace here at home. First, examine our attitude towards peace itself. Too many of us think it is impossible. Too many think it is unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. And second, let us re-examine re our attitude towards the Soviet Union. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. Among the many traits the peoples of our two countries have in common, none is stronger than our mutual abhorrence of war. Almost unique among the major world powers, we have never been at war with each other. And no nation in the history of battle ever suffered more than the Soviet Union in the Second World War. At least 20 million lost their lives. Countless millions of homes and families were burned or sacked. A third of the nation's territory 
including two-thirds of its industrial base, was turned into a wasteland, a loss equivalent to the destruction of this country east of Chicago. Today, should total war ever break out again, no matter how, our two countries will be the primary target. It is an ironic but accurate fact that the two strongest powers are the two in the most danger of devastation. All we have built, all we have worked for, would be destroyed in the first 24 hours. And even in the Cold War, which brings burdens and dangers to so many countries, including this nation's closest allies, our two countries bear the heaviest burdens. For we are both devoting massive sums of money to weapons that could be better devoted to combat ignorance, poverty, and disease. We are both caught up in a vicious and dangerous cycle with suspicion on one side breeding suspicion on the other and new weapons begetting counter weapons. In short, both the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies have a mutually deep interest in a just and genuine peace and in holding the arms race. Agreements to this end are in the interests of the Soviet Union as well as ours. And even the most hostile nations can be relied upon to accept and keep those treaty obligations and only those treaty obligations which are in their own interest. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. Third, let us re-examine our attitude towards the Cold War, remembering we're not engaged in a debate, seeking to pile up debating points. We are not here distributing blame or pointing the finger of judgment. We must deal with the world as it is, and not as it might have been, had the history of the last 18 years been different. We must therefore persevere in the search for peace in the hope that constructive changes within the communist bloc might bring within reach solutions which now seem beyond us. We must conduct our affairs in such a way that it becomes in the communist interest to agree on a genuine peace. And above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world.